certain uh, project or uh, process they have at their university uh, called the Digital uh, Innovation Greenhouse. And he's going to talk about um, the ways that that operates within the university. So without further ado, I'll hand over to you, Steve. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll save questions sort of to the end. But um, if you have questions, please type them into the general chat. And in the room, we'll, uh, we'll try to uh, work through those questions. OK, so over to you, Steve. Thanks. Great, thanks. And then am I controlling the slides, or are you guys controlling the slides? Are you guys controlling the slides? Or me? You, okay, you're controlling the slides, Steve. Okay, so I think we're at the end here. So let me see if I can find the beginning. I'm inexperienced with uh, Google with uh, Adobe, so I apologize for that. Good morning, everyone. It's evening out here in Michigan land, um, but um, uh, happy to join all this morning. Um, and um, I. I I'm the Assistant Director for Assessment and Evaluation. Um, I'm a part of our Office of Digital Education Innovation here at Michigan. I've been involved with a lot of different learning analytics initiatives um, here at Michigan. So I'm going to talk to you about some of the history of that today. And um, I don't see any slides and the audio drops out. That's not good. Is that on my end? Steve, it's Tracy. Um, no, we're all good. We can still hear you and we can still see you and your slides. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll just presume we're okay. If something goes on, let me know. Do you want all me right. to move the slides forward? No, I can do it. It's fine. Okay. All right. So I just I also wanted to give a quick shout out to Tim McKay, who was not able to join us this evening, but Tim is a uh, faculty here in physics, astronomy, and education, and as well as uh, the principal investigator of our digital innovation greenhouse. And um, so a lot of the content you'll see today was uh, co-produced with uh, Tim's help as well. So for those of you that maybe have never been to Michigan, I wanted to give you just a little bit of quick context. So Michigan's a little larger than UNISA, um, but we actually have about the same size of undergraduates, or just our graduate population, I think, is a little bit bigger. Um, and we're fairly large in terms of actual real estate on camp, um, in Ann Arbor here. Ann Arbor is about 45 minutes away from Detroit. Um, it's kind of our next largest metro, major metropolitan area. Um, so similar to UNISA, Michigan has two main campuses. Um, we have a north and central campus. The north campus is where our engineering school is, along with art, architecture, and the performing arts majors are well. Those are all in our north campus, which is that second uh, picture down there. Um, and rest of the majors are all on our central campus as well. We're mostly residential. Very few programs have any um, really distance program. We're, we're primarily a residential campus. Um, and sports also permeates much of our campus culture. Um, we're very much an American football campus. We have the largest uh, stadium in North America. That's the, what we call the Big House, that large bottom picture there. We have almost 1,000 student athletes across uh, 27 varsity teams here at Michigan. So that's uh, always maintains kind of a very uh, go blue atmosphere around here. Let's see here. All right. So really quickly, um, I'm from the Office of Digital Education at Michigan. Um, I want to probably keep uh, throwing acronyms at you guys. So if I forget and slip into acronym mode, um, someone catch me and remind me to uh, explain the acronym. So DEI is our first acronym. It, we're a fairly new office. Uh, we're a little over a year old now, which is part of our provost office. So partnering with faculty and staff initiatives and projects, uh, DEI focuses on three key areas in order to investigate and scale new modes of learning, leveraging powerful educational technologies, and utilizing learning analytics to empower faculty, staff, and administrators, and students, most of all, here on campus. And a little bit more about DEI here. So DEI is primarily a collection of consulting services focused at the intersection of three labs, 
So we have a physical lab itself called the DEI lab, and that offers a space to collaborate and explore media production capabilities and service of new pedagogical techniques. The Learning and Education and Design Lab, led by Stephanie Teasley, who is research faculty here in the School of Information, um, it's really a hub for scholarship at the intersection of higher education, technology, analytics, and learning theory. And finally, our new Digital Innovation Greenhouse uh, finds pathways to scale, scale technology-based innovations through collaborations with faculty and user communities. And all, uh, uh, the, really the nitty gritty about DIG is at the very end of our uh, presentation. So if we are right, start running out of time, someone let me know, we'll skip ahead. All right. So to ground our talk today, I wanted to uh, help set the stage um, with a brief explanation of how we define learning analytics at Michigan. Uh, I think there's a wealth of information, uh, I did some quick Google searching the other day about learning analytics at UNISA. So I found the website, um, so it looks like a lot of thanks to go to Shane Stewart and others at your campus. So it appears that we use a, a similar in, uh, definition that you all use. And we use the definition from SOLAR, or the Society for Learning Analytics Research. It's uh, really, you know, so there, I'm not going to read it for you. There, there is the uh, definition from SOLAR. But I find it really helpful to break this definition apart as we kind of expose the different co uh, components of it. So the first major component is this measurement piece. So if you think about the world of education today, it's really an instrumented world. Uh, we're seeing so much more, um, more, more than we do directly than we have before. So digital tools are mediate so much of our education today, and they faithfully remember what they've measured. So whether it's a learning management system, or it's clickers, or different tools that students use, um, they, they remember the information, and they help digest that information first, uh, very simple, maybe dashboards, but also in more sophisticated ways. And it's not only numbers, it's text, it's images, video, all that we might use and make sense of. And the next piece really there is about learners in a context. And who, who do we mean by learners? And in this case, we mean all learners on campus. So primarily that's our students, whether they be on campus, which is the majority of our students, but also off campus as well. But we also mean learners in other contexts, where are their faculty learners or their staff learners, really our whole learning community. And understanding uh, the context uh, for that learning really requires a broad vision. So there's a context is extending from the classroom, but also beyond, particularly when we think about co-curricular learning, learning that students or learners of all types do around the world, and then might be bringing back to a residential campus. And finally, it's really this piece of understanding and optimizing uh, learning. And it's, it's dual goals. So it's understanding teaching and learning and really making teaching and learning better. Um, so an, an understanding piece and really optimizing. And this is typically at the personal level, not necessarily at the institution in aggregate. So our focus is really trying to get um, to focus on learning as a human process. Um, it's deeply context dependent, so we uh, may not find universal flaws, but we need uh, universal laws out there. But we uh, remain vigilant and responsive to change. Uh, that uh, finding the data that provides a way to remain aware of every student as an individual, um, and without a hold, we can't really hope to tailor information, personalize uh, personalized education for every student. Um, so this ability to attend to every student is especially important to us as our community becomes more diverse at Michigan and beyond. So one thing that uh, we like to talk about is, is analytics really new? And if you talk about analytics just as its own term, you can see that it has spikes going all the way back to the 1700s there. And that's when analytics was used a lot in the math culture and then it kind of died out. So this is using uh, Google's Ngram viewer, which uh, really is scanning all the books that go up through 2008 through Google's uh, viewer. You can see that over the, um, through in the 2000, 2008, that there started to be a spike of analytics used as uh, things like Google Analytics uh, remained in vogue. But if you uh, type in the full phrase learning analytics, 
into Engram Viewer, you're going to find that there's nothing there. So at least since 2008, um, it doesn't appear in any more than any in any of the more than 10 million books that Google has scanned. So uh, something is really new here, at least in, as you put those two terms together. So the other question of is it is new is that uh, the trends that learning analytics uncovers may not be themselves so new. So uh, this is an image that uh, several folks in the learning analytics folk, uh, learning analytics talks have used. Um, it's a commonly used image of the classroom from the 12th century. You notice here you see students in rows. Um, there's a lecture on high. There's books or notes being taken. There's notes, uh, there's also also if you look in the back row there. There's uh, students talking, and yes, you have that. Um, you got that one learner fast asleep. Okay, so let, let's fast forward here. So this is Michigan. This is one of our largest lecture halls on campus. This is uh, circa 2009 when this picture was taken, and yes, we see students in rows. They're taking notes. They're there. Uh, there's someone in the front there that should be on the picture, and yes, if if we. Uh, Zoom in there, there is someone fast asleep. So the point of learning analytics is not that, you know, the activities might be new, the actual, is that there were actually now through uh, the mediation of technology and through the affordance of us keeping data on so many things, we're actually now able to instrument learner activities and find actionable points in time using that data. So it's really finding the actionable piece and I'll come back to that theme several times. But why learning analytics now? Why why is it really popular now? Why do we keep hearing it? And is this this confluence of events that first is the data? Um, so we've had this data, and it's been brought up that many institutions have uh, now collected this data and kept it for reporting purposes. But as the data is now in a place where it can inform teaching and learning questions, and those questions are increasingly extensive and accessible. And secondly, we've we've now come into this area of data, of a really a data science field, where there's new and innovative analytic approaches to digesting, visualizing, and acting on these data that emerge every day through things like like advanced statistical tools, machine learning, social network analysis, natural language processing, and what have you, and growing every seems seems every day. But our key point um, that we return to in Michigan is that really our primary focus here at Michigan is the learner. And while we have key business intelligence and institutional analytics questions um, for, for an institution as well as departmental and instructional levels, learners remain to be our key constituency. And it's really something that we strive to keep in the forefront of everything we do here in Michigan. So uh, courtesy of Tim and also um, his wife, who happens to be a librarian here in Michigan, uh, we, we have the affordance of actually going back and providing not just a context of some of our recent activities for the last four years, but even going way back. So this is, this is a very quick history lesson of the origins of learning analytics at Michigan. So um, very quickly, um, through our first 95 years here in Michigan, we didn't have grades. So from 1817 all the way to 1912, Michigan resisted the calls to even rank its students. Um, instead, we measured students on simple absolute scale. Student achievement was basically uh, whether students passed or they did not, or they did not pass, or there was conditioned. And not passed didn't necessarily mean failing. It was more of a mastery system back then, um, which is interesting with now the recent calls. Um, now to look at competency-based education here in the U.S. Uh, but many things have ch uh, changed in the early 20th century. Enrollments increased thanks to the Industrial Revolution, and a much more flexible uh, elective curriculum was adopted, so students could enroll in lots of different types of classes. So in the spirit for, in the spirit for quantification, um, even for human traits, was abroad uh, throughout the U.S. Uh, what really finally pushed the faculty across the line to adopt grades here at Michigan was a desire to host a chapter of Phi Beta, Phi Beta, Beta Kappa, um, which is an honor society. And Phi Beta Kappa requires that you actually have to rank the students. 
So this uh, required a mechanism for identifying the top students in every class. So grades were adopted in order to accomplish that goal. But here in Michigan, um, uh, faculty members were aware of their concerns that were throughout higher ed of grades uh, being discussed in higher ed. And so in the early years, grades were very closely monitored and publicly reported. Um, so here's some early images. You can see that it goes down to individual faculty members and they're reporting the grades for everyone. Um, and we can zoom in on one of them here. You can see there's, this is for economics and it goes through every instructor and the number of students they taught and the breakdown between A, B, C, D, and E and the percentage of students receiving those grades. Um, so that actually revealed the distributions of grades by each instructor in each course they taught. Something that actually now it, a lot of faculty would kind of balk at the being that publicly available and that distributed. And this was in the first year that grades were cre really distributed and created here at Michigan. So uh, we have a character that emerges here. So the desire to take advantage of the human evidence uh, containing grades was great and was uh, very broad based and our leadership was really interested in it. So one of the first five vice presidential appointments here in Michigan was a VP for educational investigations. And his name was Clarence Yoakum. And he was famous for his work with Yerkes in the World War II Army mental tests, which uh, resulted in the intelligence quotient or IQ. And Yoakum held this position for a long time from 1927, from 1927 all the way till his death in 1945. Um, and the invest investigations, educational investigations were built into the institution in, in a very prominent way from the very first stages of applying grades. Um, uh, this uh, was a picture that Tim was able to dig up, um, courtesy of his wife, um, as well one of the physics summer schools that uh, was held here at Michigan. And uh, it's a, actually a really cool picture because it situates Yoakum at um, within a lot of the other folks who happen to be around in Michigan doing different uh, quantum mechanics investigations. So you see some famous physicists like uh, Werner and Heisenberg and Fermi, guys doing uh, some pretty famous stuff. That Heisenberg stuff, that Heisenberg guy, I think he's famous for something. Yeah, it's explosive, really. And not see you guys. So I have no idea if my jokes are uh, landing at all. We'll, we'll assume they are. Um, so during his career, Yoakum led a substantial. He led a substantial team of social science researchers. They were exploring uh, topics which today we would probably call learning analytics. In some ways, they made efforts to explore uh, how how to use a lot of data and admissions criteria as predictors of student uh, student performance. In general. So you can see here, here's some of the stuff they found that compared 1926, 1927. 19, so they're looking at some longitudinal uh, trends here. Yay, Patrick says to remind jokes are landing. That's good. Uh, so in general, they found that grades worked poorly and they only weekly correlated the admission, that only we, we, the admissions trends only weekly correlated with student grades. Kind of, you know. Uh, things that be uh, that be uh, crazy to say today, or you know, maybe not so crazy. Um, even in the 1930s, it was clear that the best predictor of future grades was actually past grades, uh, something that we are going to see that repeats itself all the way into present day grades today. Uh, Yoakum's team also explored academic admissions criteria that I just mentioned, um, and they reached a somewhat distressing conclusion that predicting college success from pre-college criteria is kind of difficult and kind of a chancy business. Shocking. And here you can see some of the reports. Um, so the one on the left is from early on. This was Yoakum stuff. And it says right here that um, this work really continued all the way to his, to his death in various forms. Um, and they see right here the results uh, strongly, strongly indicate that there's a chance of selection for individuals for college entrance. The result might be expected since grades for different years in college correlate, for the most part, only in the 50s. So you've seen these trends repeat. 
but um, it actually got less, uh, actually lost prominence on campus. You actually see by the 70s, um, the titles uh, kind of reflect, you know, it's the 70s. We're very, uh, in the, at least in the U.S., it was very much a hippie culture. So, you, had, you know, it's grading, testing, standards, and all that stuff that we don't necessarily, you know, it's not necessarily in vogue. Um, so it almost become an almost informal topic and it got considered. Can you hear me, Steve? Okay. You may have... Uh, yeah, just type away. Ask him to reboot, I guess. Just restart. I don't know. Just type. Hello, hello. Hey, Steve. How you doing? Nice to see you again. I'm all right. There was some problem with dropping out. I'm not sure whose end it was, but um, we'll be we're ready to go when you are, mate. Okay. Should we forego webcam? Then? Yeah, that might be a good idea. We can hear you fine. Okay, great. Okay, so did you? Well, I don't know where you guys lost me. Okay, we were just, you were just uh, talking about 70s attitudes to, um, ah, to grading and, and general hippie culture in the US. Uh, yes, so basically, um, to make a, a, again, feedback on your end, so if you just want to mute Patrick. Okay, um, so really, um, by the 70s, this work had been consigned to the Office of Examens and Evaluations, which was quite quite removed from the intellectual center of discussion on campus. Um, by 1975, because of that hippie culture, it had become almost an informal topic, as you can see by the title of this report. So it was grading, testing, standards, and all that. Not very exciting stuff. Um, which is ironic that um, that I had dropped and uh, not become in vogue um, right at that time, because um, the report marked actually what it uh, the, so this report by Frick, um, who's the guy that created that seventies report, kind of marked the end of what Yoakum and the others had started uh, really the first decades of the twentieth century. Um, so during this period, ironically, uh, there was actually when computers first appeared on the scene. There's computers. We don't know what they do, but they're correct. They're collecting lots of stuff. And you can see that our student information system here at Michigan was created in the 1990s in order to really facilitate academic reporting to the state and national government. But there was this growing interest, particularly by the faculty, of what this data contained and how could they distill that rich information. So early on, they uh, had this tool called the Academic Reporting Toolkit, or ART. Um, and this tool really was this uh, effort to try to distill the information that was in this new UM data warehouse. 
uh, and make that information available to faculty. So I'm going to talk about R a little bit more within the context of DIG a little later on. But um, it sounds like we're all good, so I'll keep going. Keep going, stay real good. Okay. So as the use, so the creation of this art tool also coincided with our use of a of the Sakai based learning learning management system, um, which became a widespread in our campus. So this uh, occurred in uh, around 2005 is when we really started using Sakai here on campus. And uh, Stephanie Teasley's use lab, um, myself included, I was a member of that lab. And we uh, began focusing on who was using the learning management system and some of the relationships between LMS usage and student outcomes. Um, we also started starting uh, putting that data or those findings to use in the creation of advising support tools like the Student Explorer tool, which I'll talk about more in a little bit as well. Um, there's also some efforts around 2008 emerging in uh, physics. So Tim McKay, uh, along with some of his colleagues, Dave Gerdes and Gus Everard, began exploring the progress of students through introductory physics courses and those sequences. And they uncovered or really rediscovered, uh, if we go back to uh, some of the stuff that we just talked about in some cases, um, really discovered some substanti substantial differences between students' overall GPA and course grades or grade penalties, as you might say, um, between students who came in with a certain GPA grade point average and found that those courses actually hurt their GPA, as well as gender dis dis differences between those grades and those classes. And as, uh, as the decade began to end in the first decade of the 2000s, uh, around November 2010, Stephanie and Tim met to discuss exploring this, what is this learning analytics thing that's starting to be mentioned? And could we stop or start this community on campus and maybe have further discussions? I'm sorry to hear you're having problems, Kirsten. Or Kirsten. So um, they originally proposed uh, running a series of academic analytics seminars or running AA meetings uh, has a, another connotation here in the States at least. Um, so we tried to find another name for them and a, uh, we, we settled on SLAM or, and this is the Student Learning in Analytics at Michigan or SLAM lecture series and that was born in fall 2011. And this is actually Tim's slide from the very first SLAM talk. If you Google SLAM at Michigan, um, you will actually find the archive of all the talks. And these talks featured uh, both internal as well as external guests from around the world and played a very important role in building our community for learning analytics in, learning analytics in Michigan. And this started really with Tim and myself. Stephanie actually happened to be on sabbatical that very first term. And Tim would host it and I would be uh, with a video camera in the back of the room. And uh, it's fortunate that uh, we had the resources at Michigan and eventually our, uh, our colleagues at the Center for Research and Learning and Teaching here in Michigan took over the recording and were able to get uh, some higher quality as well. And all those slam talks, both the slides and the video are freely available online. Um, just Google UMich Slam and you will find it. Um, so this is a great way to really begin the community and have a discussion. Around the same time, and you're going to see some more acronyms flying at you here, this was our Faculty Senate, or SACUA. Uh, I forget exactly what it's saying, but it's uh, basically our, uh, our faculty governance body here on campus. They had a committee called the Academic Affairs Advisory Committee, or AAAC. And they committed a report um, that was really talking about all the different types of assessment that were available on campus and all the different data sources for that assessment. And because there was a report, they had to do something. And with this emergence of this community around learning analytics, our provost at the time, uh, Phil Hanlon, sponsored the launch of a learning analytics task force, or LATF. And this is a group about a, of a dozen faculty or so dozen faculty yeah, who were charged with exploring the state of learning analytics uh, data, so uh, teaching and learning data, so they defined it, 
on our campus. So they have three charges, explore the rich, the information environment, and recommend to the provost environments to improve that environment to ensure that we remain leaders in that field or in that area. Uh, design and execute funding, a funding program for uh, emergent learning uh, projects to really explore the space and also review the existing metrics for the ways we evaluate teaching and learning uh, at Michigan. So that was initial charge. Here are some of the faculty that were part of that initiative. And you can see here that of the uh, dozen or so faculty that were that were part of this team for three years, the membership was intentionally cross-disciplinary. So it reflected the different traditions and points of interest in educational data. So social sciences were men were uh, as well as uh, computer science was represented, as well as natural sciences, engineering, humanities, were all represented in this core group. And they also invited others occasionally to speak to them. So very quickly, I wanted to uh, discuss some of the early learning analytics projects that um, the LATF funded um, early on. And some of them, well, these two examples uh, were actually funded me um, in some of my work. So I, I'm privy to them. So uh, here we go. Oh, thank you for that glint, crazy. That's for all the slam talks. So this is Student Explorer. Student Explorer is an early warning system, similar to other kind of early warning systems that are now really commonly available in higher ed and even are included in packages for some learning management systems. However, uh, back when this tool was first created, uh, we, we specifically designed it to distill analytic information for one key constituency who had actually come to our lab, which was at that time the use lab, for help. They actually wanted data that they didn't have available to them, and this was academic advisors. And advisors sit at the intersection of students and instructors, and they are one of the few folks on campus whose sole role is to really look across courses. So across courses that students are enrolled in, how are they doing? And ironically, while the student, while academic advisors have this role, they often don't have data available to them. So this was a way to say, how can we design a way to facilitate bringing that kind of analytic data to advisors and the ways they could utilize it. And instead of solely using a predictive algorithm, we really use a classification scheme. So you can see that scheme there. And the, the core uh, idea behind that scheme was identify which students and what messages advisors should send to students. So uh, here's some quick screenshots from this tool. And what Student Explorer does is it draws information out from the learning management systems, both uh, Sakai and as well now Canvas here in Michigan, and categorizes the type of feedback that advisors should provide for each student in each course. And this, and this information is normed to the course average in each case. So if the entire course is not doing so well, then it's normed to that context. Whereas uh, if the student is is perform underperforming to the course mean, then it's norm to that context as well. So should the advisor encourage strong performance and behavior? Should they explore maybe some marginal performance of the student? Or should they, should they engage some problematic performance or behavior? And it provides the assignment details, both quantitative and qualitative, and allows the advisors who usually have or typically have a deep interaction w with the targeted student and allows them to leverage their institutional knowledge about the course or the instructor. Now, one of the things that, afford, that has the affordance of when you create a tool that uses analytic data is then that tool itself also exposes data in itself or uh, what it calls, uh, it, it also provides some of this uh, digital exhaust or data exhaust that we tend to term to call a lot of what analytics tools or different digital tools provide. Or because we're now using an analytics tool and itself is providing data, it uh, gets to the level of what my uh, one of my graduate students called, we're now not doing just learning analytics, we're doing metalytics at the, at the next level up. So here's one visualization that we created for looking at how a set of advisors use Student Explorer in summer 2013. So the red dots 
are all individual um, appointments that advisors had with students. I'm oh, sorry, the red dots are all the activity they had with Student Explorer. And the blue dots, let's see if this works here, is their activity in Student Explorer. And when it turns purple, that's the overlap. And it allows us to quickly see some trends. So early on in the term, there's not a lot of data, there's not a lot of activity in Student Explorer. We don't see many of those blue dots. And late in the term, when there's not a lot of chance to uh, intervene or see what the student's saying, you know, we can't really change your, your behavior very much. There's not a lot of activity at the end. We, we also know that advisors don't tend to meet with students very much during lunchtime. So that's good to know. But when we start to tease apart that it looks from this trend that they might be meeting I and mean, they might actually be using Student Explorer while they actually meet with students. We see that overlap. If we can actually tease that out further. So uh, this actually is overlapping with uh, our logo. Apologize for that. Um, but the blue dot, so the, the different columns are actually the different courses that students are enrolled in in the Summer Bridge program. So CSP is a general class, then comes math, and then, uh, sorry, then comes English, and then comes math, and then kind of an overall summary statistic. Oop. And really what this tells us is that while we had not originally intended for the tool to be used face-to-face -face with, face -face with students, uh, the advisors are actually using this in context with students as a tool to be used to actually facilitate their discussions. So did this change the, actually the design needs um, that, we, that we had going on? So as this tool now scales, this is now under um, user experience review as part of the Digital Innovation Greenhouse, which I'll talk about in a little bit. So really quickly, one of the other um, experiments that we did, actually, I'm going to skip over this, but you can, uh, we had a paper that was produced for the Learning Analytics and Knowledge Conference called uh, it Really Explore Customized Course Analytics. I'm running a little long here, so I'm going to skip over these slides real quick. All right. So one of the key components of the Learning Analytics Task Force was to help build a community of Learning Analytics researchers here at Michigan. And this was uh, facilitated by building uh, not only the SLAM series, and continuing that SLAM series of talks, but also these Learning Analytics Fellows. And what these fellows were, were, were two cohorts of faculty, graduate students, and staff to help explore what Learning Analytics data was available here in Michigan, and also uh, provide small pools of uh, funds so they could conduct small-scale experiments. And this exposed some additional risks. So there, there was some acknowledgement that now we're, we we're broadening the pool of people who had access to our data and could do things with it. But we needed to continually uh, explore this and really uh, express the benefit to why, what, how this data could be uh, could be useful. And Tracy just gave a shout out for attendees and even the local folks. If you have questions, feel free to shout them out or interrupt me. We can definitely, if I'm talking too fast or reason over stuff. Okay. Um, so, all right, I'm going ahead. All right. So, really quickly, one of two of the experiments that emerged out of uh, out of these cohorts or these learning analytics fellows. Here's one. So this experimented with um, this is our placement, and this is kind of a uh, hard hard uh, slide to distill. So I'll do the best I can without a pointer. Um, but um, so on the top here you have was traditional at least in the u.s for chemistry for chemistry curriculum whereas usually students have two semesters of general chemistry and then they have two semesters of organic chemistry so if students are going to expose themselves to chemistry that's usually the model um but of course we're different here in michigan so what we do is we use a combination of your high school chemistry and placement exams and a placement exam we have here or AP scores. So depending on the placement exam or the AP classes, so this advanced placement exams that many uh, students can elect to take in here in high school, there's all these rules. So if you, uh, if you score below the 70th percentile or above the 70th percentile, you might land first in our Chem 130 
which is the general chemistry. And then you might progress to, our, to our, your two semesters organic chemistry, or you might, based on the placement exam or the AP or the AP test, land right away in organic chemistry. And then um, more the uh, the uh, pre health students or the biology folks might then have a follow up general chemistry course later on. And really, the questions were for the folks in. So this is uh, the folks, or the fellows in learning analytics. Were really can data verify the, these that we made these rules once upon a time based on our hunches, and are we? Does the rules we put in place actually place students so accurately? And really, are they more successful in organic chemistry based on these rules that we've set up? So what they were able to do is run a regression discontinuity analysis. And they found differences based on the AP scores really between, uh, between ethnicities. But the regression discontinuity uh, um, basically was a quasi-experimental design. And this uh, basically verified that the placement, that the placement exam provides that there is this benefit for organic and organic chemistry grades. So you can see that the, uh, the chart kind of goes up and then goes back down again. For students who place directly in organic chemistry, um, they, they're a little lower than the students who actually uh, have some benefit. This is the, grade, the grades they actually get in the organic, organic chemistry class. So there is this benefit, and the grades actually improve by about 0 0.2, per, uh, 0.2 letter grades. So almost the difference between a plus and so if you get a between a, like a B and a B plus. So there is a real difference, but not especially a large difference. So while we think like we're you know we have all these rules in place that are going to benefit our students, maybe the actual benefits on the ground are not overwhelmingly large. Um, there's also this implicit benefit, right, for students who maybe are a semester older, or they have experience, course, they have more experience with large courses. So there might be other gains to having students as you take the general general chemistry class first. Another approach that has emerged out of our learning analytics fellows is this idea of matching. So this was a study uh, led by Chris Brooks, Helen Morgan, and Jennifer Maltby. And they want to demonstrate the benefits of one of our learning living communities we here at Michigan. So we have about seven or eight of these learning living learning communities here, which are specialized communities that students all live together. They might be focused on a particular discipline or um, another area that really brings students together. So maybe sometimes it's students might need a special academic interest or might need actually academic coaching together. Um, so this one actually had focused on the health sciences and the health sciences, they have a scholar program. It's all first year students. They all live together in this hall that's pictured here. And they had seven years of data. And they wanted to say uh, using kind of more of a matching technique, which again is a more quasi experimental design, could they show the benefits of the of the students, particularly they wanted to show the benefits maybe for some special populations of students. So they use this match samples technique. And what they did is they can see they match on several parameters. There's actually 13 parameters listed here. Everything from uh, an, uh, entry <laughs> exams, so these are the academic college test or ACT score. Some are uh, if you also are converted from SAT. Students had that test. A number, the year they enrolled, citizenship status, the gender, ethnicity, all these kind of different things that we are, that are able to tease out of our student information system. And the idea is to get to very close to an experimental study. And they were also, also able to draw um, data from the National Student Clearinghouse. This is a service here in the United States that tracks both undergraduate and graduate enrollment across the United States. Uh, institutions provide the data. Uh, it originally was to uh, validate financial aid information. But now institutions provide this data, and then they're able to get similar information back out from all their participating institutions. So it covers almost 90% of institutions here at the US. So you can tell the researchers who actually was admitted and enrolled in medical school, nursing programs, et cetera, um, beyond the class. So through this matching technique, they were able to basically look at students who were similar to students from the general population matched on these different criteria. 
and you see so here are some of their general results. Now, if they, the very top is, you can see there's a little frowny face on top there, um, is that if you just look at all students in the learning community, there's no statistical, statistical difference between general students in the in general population in Michigan. That this and we're a highly competitive school, so this isn't terribly surprising, right? That's most for most students who want to be doctors or nurses or that kind of thing in Michigan. The program really doesn't have an effect. Students who want to be a doctor will be successful, whether or not they're part of that program. However, if we look at underrepresented minorities here, so these are self-identified Black, Hispanic, or Native American students here at Michigan, this does have an effect. So there's 127 of those students over the seven years that they were looking at, um, they were able to match across the general population, and they were able to see that there's a benefit that there are more students who who uh, declared in science programs and more students who actually completed um, a master in related science degrees. Um, and they were able to, so not only for underrepresented minorities, they were able to see that for students who are first generation status, this had a similar benefit as well. So this technique could, could also be used in others. You can see how this technique could be used in other situations where even if the original intent or the original population didn't really have an experimental, this provides the ability to have kind of a quasi-experimental design in accordance to it. And this is so. Simultaneously with uh, building this community, we are really working at Michigan here to open up our data for use both on our own campus as well as uh, out, uh, as well as off campus. So here, uh, here and beyond our campus. So uh, several things going on here at Michigan. We have a uh, so we just talked about the Learning LX Fellows Program. So help bringing this data together uh, through this program, we were able to develop a memorandum of understanding. Uh, that helped. That was a way to simplify the data access. Our data access is always there, but it was kind of hidden between very hard to understand web pages and a kind of and a legacy system to gain access. So this was a way to simplify that process. At the same time, um, our associate vice provost for digital education he opened this new office, which I'm not part of. Uh, and it, we're trying to actually establish a new campus-wide privacy statement. So to try to be more transparent about the data that we're collecting on campus, so students are aware, not only are we collecting this data, but we're trying to actually use it to improve teaching and learning on campus and making that highly visible to students. We also, through all these efforts, continue to try to build trust in their community. Um, that it's really, something that Tim and I have both commented on that we've seen is that relationships have been built and there is trust amongst units and between units and the central IT organization. And, to, and I was able to leverage that to build what we call a learning analytics architecture team. So I'll talk about the reason for that very briefly. Um, so this is our MOU, this is a quick screenshot of the MOU process. So this is really just simplifies the process that after you get IRB approval or human subjects approval here in Michigan, this just spells out what the agreements are between you and the data stewards. And what, what we will do with the data and how will you maintain it appropriately, how you make sure that it's anonymized, that you're not, you know, po posting, you know, uh, de-anonymized student grades on Twitter, those kind of things. So this is our current, uh, for, for those of you that are more techies in the room or more uh, enterprise data architects, you'll appreciate these kind of uh, these kind of diagrams. This is essentially our data sources on campus, data integration layer, consumption layer, and goes out to the user interface. This is not highly usable by researchers today. And even though um, they're aware of more common data sets, so the data consumption layer gets spit out into these different data sets. So there's a student data set, there's a teaching and learning data set, there's data sets more about uh, instructors and their history, and those are all available to people, but they're just separate, they're not very easy to merge together and they're complicated and not everyone's entirely sure of what's in each of these data sets. So 
what I set out to do is I got a group together that was part of our student records team, our admissions, our financial aid, and really trying to say, trying to establish a new vision for a learning out service. Create a campus service that offers data, tools, and consultation for learning and research analytics in support of the academic research missions of the university. And the idea is that right now, the data that you get out of our data warehouse is very database friendly. It comes very uh, in large columns and with multiple rows per column. So when I say that I want to see all the courses a student has taken in winter 2012, those are in multiple rows. Now, any researcher that's used Stata or R or SPSS knows that you have to then convert that data into rows because in order to say anything about those students, you want all that data in individual rows, one row per student. So the idea is, can we actually organize our data in Michigan centrally so that it actually spits out this data to satisfy kind of 80 percent, 80, 90 percent of what we call learning the typical quote unquote learning analytics questions and actually spits them out in a more horizontal format so that researchers could answer start answering their questions nearly immediately upon re seeing the data instead of spending three or four months massaging the data and getting it ready for analysis which is really our case now. So this is some of the effort that we went through. Uh, we started this effort back in January, and uh, have, uh, now our uh, central IT organization is working on actually building this out. Thanks for coming, Liz. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure Tracy and et al. will have the slides hopefully available to you all, um, or be able to email them out. If not, I'm happy to send those. Um, so you can see this is some of the work we had to work through saying where is the data, does it need to be converted, does it need to be transformed or whatever, particularly for statistical packages to transform the data that might be stored more in a qualitative format. So with like yes, no flags or more qualitative flags and turning those into zero ones or things that are more readily usable by statistical packages. And we also have this effort to try to open the data beyond campus. So there is this uh, organization here that we're, the Michigan is part of. It's the Committee on Institutional Cooperation, uh, and it's called the CIC. And another way to think about this group, of it's all these Midwest uh, uh, universities. They're all sim very similar in size. But it's really all, all 14 of the Big Ten institutions. So if you Google Big Ten, or Big Ten CIC, you'll find it, and it's just, it's ironic that it's not only an athletic uh, partnership between these universities, it's also an academic partnership. So because of the longevity, um, Big Ten was actually the first athletic conference created, there's also this long-standing uh, uh, academic partnership as well. So the CIC has all these different committees, all the CIC provosts get together on a monthly basis. It's, uh, it's pretty cool. Thanks, Tracy. Uh, she's hot on the Google. Um, so there was this effort in summer 2013 and 2014 to extend uh, the LTEF program and present a process across the IC. So the Sloan Foundation, which is a nonprofit organization here in the U.S., sponsored an activity across CIC schools trying to compare some of the early work that uh, Tim McKay and others had done across institutions. So lots of institutions came and listened. About five institutions were in the place where they could actually bring their data and find a way to compare across institutions. So about five of them were able to, and I think it may have grown maybe to six or seven even beyond that. So here's one analysis they were able to do. So we talked, I mentioned early on um, that Tim and some of his colleagues in physics had talked about grade penalties. So this is one course. We're not going to say which course it is, but I can tell you that Michigan is the, is the top left graph there. And then three other schools are represented. This is the same course. So we're able to use uh, codes that we have here across and so making sure that are we still talking about the same introductory course or other kind of large course on campus? So a similar course, similar kind of content. And you can see across schools, what, um, what you see on the uh, 
y-axis there is the course grade they received in this class, and the x or the x-axis is the adjusted cumulative GPA. So you can see that by and large, most students come into this class and they don't do as well as their GPA. So if they're coming in with a 3.0 GPA, they actually exit with this class of a worse grade below that GPA. Um, and you can see that there's also disparity here that across institutions that we're seeing a similarity between the differences between female students and male students, that male students across institutions are, are now getting a similar grade penalty across and male students by and large seem to be doing well. So what it tells us is that this is not an extrinsic or an intrinsic thing to just one university. We're starting to see trends across. So this begins to start to tell us, illuminate maybe some actionable things about the structure of these courses that we see, continue to see calls for more active learning, more engaged learning activities for students, more problem-based learning, different things that are less of instructor-centric, instructors uh, saying, you know, sage on the stage becoming more of the guide on the side and allowing students to really personalize their learning. And this is information that says maybe this is a reason to explore more of those more of those uh, pedagogical approaches to see if we start to see a trend, be able to close that gap and close the um, the, the grade penalty that we're seeing. So part of this is also the idea to, to bring together lots of the disparate data that are available in different research projects that are cutting across the CIC institutions and multi-institutional efforts. Could we actually start to build a multi-institutional data set that provides more of the total picture of the impact of, resident, of research universities? So this uh, effort is actually underway here at IS uh, in our Institute of Social Research. Um, the uh, PI for this group is Jason Owen Smith. They created a new Institute for Research on Innovation and Science, or IRIS, uh, here in Michigan. And this was initially funded, again, by the Solar Foundation to really look at the research expenditures. But it's trying to unite it uh, with all the other data. So we're starting to see, okay, if you, if you had an impact in some sort of research on our campus, what did that do to your income? What did that do to your employment? Later on, what was the, what was the uh, outcomes of that research in multiple ways? Could we then unite it, unite that data with our educational or you know teaching data, um, and then also unite it with the U.S. Census data? Where did everyone go? How did they perform in classes? What experience did they have with research? Then where did they go beyond the University of Michigan? What kind of uh, if they were able to combine that with the census data, how much money maybe did they make? to start to get some really powerful outcomes. So this research side has already begun. We're starting to also lay the groundwork to add learning and looks data to as well. And perhaps there's also a, 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 a simultaneous initiative going on with our health system data as well here in Michigan. So lots of desperate pieces of data starting to come together in large data sets. Could we then start to merge those large data sets and start to get some really powerful, uh, powerful findings? using some of the techniques that I just mentioned. And some of this foundational work has just launched. So just last week, we had uh, the, the official launch of our Michigan Institute for Data Science, or MIDAS, for yet another acronym to throw at you. This is a $100 million initiative um, with 30 new faculty members, 20 of whom will be cross-listed or cross-appointments with existing, but also 10 new faculty lines. Uh, there'll be new graduate programs, new undergraduate programs, etc. And the vision of this is to support foundational cross-disciplinary work for data science across four domains. And the four domains that Michigan is actually already fairly strong in. So this is new transportation research, uh, really focused on automated cars, social sciences, health sciences, a lot of that work focused on brain science as well as learning analytics, which is one of the four core pillars uh, initially for this new data science institute. And much of this early work will extend, um, the, much of our early work in learning analytics will be extended or be ability to explain extend in MIDAS. I just literally got an email this afternoon. Um, so we're running out of time. So I'm going to skip ahead. And luckily, uh, we're actually not too far away from talking about DIG. So that's good. 
So we're putting the data to use. And one of the three core initiatives that emerged, or three of the core initiatives that emerged out of the Learning Analytics Task Force, LATF, were these core, were three core tools. Um, so it is, uh, sorry, let me find my notes. It is Student Explorer, which I mentioned. It's Tim McKay's eCoach tool, and also overseeing the creation of the next generation of the academic reporting toolkit. And the, uh, the idea of DIG, or the Digital Innovation Greenhouse, is to bring innovations that emerge out of these research groups to scale, kind of cross the chasm um, where a lot of these early innovations in, in dead tech have died before. So we're, uh, the idea is to hire three core developers. So these are the developers you see right here um, that we have uh, were hired in uh, the spring here at Michigan. And to work across the user communities and work with core innovators who establish these tools and to work with user communities and the folks uh, running our IT infrastructure to see how do we appropriately scale these tools. And really the core vision, oops, there's my little cloud here. Um, since many of these tools and projects share, share similar data and techniques, can they share similar approaches, data sets, and even functionality? Cross-breeding, if you will, if you like that greenhouse metaphor, to ultimately result in a strong and vibrant crop, quote unquote, of analytics tools that support residential education. So I'm going to breeze past uh, some, uh, so the idea of the first kind of tool emerging is really using this, these uh, infrastructure that we've talked about to, to extend art, the academic reporting toolkit, to also be student facing. So students, for example, in physics could say, okay, well, I'm, I'm a student in physics. Who else is taking this class? Are they engineering students? Are they natural science students? Are they humanities students? But what kind of grades do they typically, typically get? Do humanities students tend to do worse than maybe engineering students in this class? And if I'm, a, if I'm ma thinking of majoring in physics, what courses do, do physics majors even take? And how do they do in this class? How do I compare with other physics majors? Uh, what could I do maybe to, to, if I'm not doing as well as other students have done historically in these classes, maybe what are some resources that I could reach out to or utilize here on campus? And the, really the core work is, here that the Learning Analytics Task Force through the first kind of four years and the task force through their three years of initial work is really is truly trying to find permanent homes for much of the work that they were enable to launch. So data-driven data tool development will now exist with this new digital innovation greenhouse, well, which is has a home within the Office of Digital Education Innovation, or DEI, and it has a strong partnership also with the Learning Education and Design Lab, really D-Lab, which is the uh, lab that the Youth Lab used to be, so it's now changed names. A lot of the research, as I just talked about, will now, um, now be conducted within the MIDAS Institute, but also have um, other, other cross-disciplinary communities, um, like, for example, the Causal Inference and Research uh, an educational research sim symposium exists here in Michigan. And there, we also hope to influence the larger communities. So Solar is one of them, and uh, Shane has noted that there, there was a large Michigan contingent. Last time we had uh, some represent representation at the, at, the, uh, at the Learning Analytics and Knowledge Conference, or LAC. And there's also this Practical Learning Analytics MOOC that has just launched. And that's really where I'm going to leave you guys. So uh, I want to end with a plug. So this is a MOOC that just launched last week. It's in our second week, so it's not too late to join. There's the URL for you. And the idea for this MOOC, and there's Tim. Um, he, he is leading this MOOC. It's the first time we are, we are still recording, so we're, we're launching as we build or as we launch. Um, and the idea is to have, be a little different than traditional MOOCs, which are a little bit more uh, uniform and linear. This is to, to, intended to be more of a smorgasbord. So you can either be more of a lightweight engagement or go deep, depending on their level of interest. And uh, addressing different types of questions for different audiences. So what are the kind of audiences that administrators have versus learners have versus instructors have? And really this, this new MOOC reflects really where our Michigan focus are. 
And so our focus for learning analytics research here in Michigan is really investigate student behaviors, not just the content that students uh, kind of progress through. So we're drawing information from student grades, but we're also through all these different mediated tools that students now interact with, we're able, able to more deeply investigate the patterns of behavior as well as their work. So now with these new techniques, we're hopefully getting the process of investigating uh, more of their work. So I was thinking about their exams, but as well as their writing. So leveraging natural language processing, for example, to really say what, what elucidations and what knowledge are students uh, progressing through their writing. So there's lots of different activity, lots of different kinds of impact, but uh, I think hopefully you've seen the kind of different groundwork we've laid here in Michigan. And now we've set the place where lots of different kinds of people are able to carefully, intelligently allow uh, different researchers and students to explore this data and act upon it. So hopefully we still have some time for questions. Um, there's all my contact information. Uh, so there's my email and I'm on Twitter. And again, there is our website uh, for digital education here at Michigan. Okay, thanks very much, Steve. That was fascinating. I'll just ask the room if there are any questions for Steve. And if there are any questions online, we, we just have a couple of minutes because there is another class waiting to come into the room uh, in a moment. But if there's any questions in the room, I'm happy to give you the microphone. No? Shane, you look like you have a question. Here's Shane Dawson. Hey, Steve. Thanks very much for that. Um, I'm sorry you had to cite Chris Brooks, Brooks work. That must have been damaging for you. The um, the the diagram you showed before um, on the students who could uh, the art diagram, uh -huh. uh, which shows the students undertaking if I'm in physics, what other physics students have taken. That's the beastie. Have you have you seen uh -huh. whether or not that actually influences students being directed into a particular pathway? So it actually constrains their options. Or, um, or are they still being quite exploratory? So this is still exploratory. This is the kind of very first visualization. I think one of the things we uh, learned with uh, with the folks that produced this on the physics side, and then I should take it over to the School of Information and said, okay, HCR, commu human computer interaction students, do people actually understand what this graph says? And we're like, um, let's simplify this down quite a bit. So a lot of the work that's going on right now is to be able to actually create visualizations that are actually intelligible by students. Um, so they are deep in the trenches right now, but the hope is to actually have some visualizations that are available to students uh, for their backpacking and registration this fall. So this fall will be the first time that we start to expose some of these to students and start to see what did they even do with it? Thanks, Steve. Uh, I've got one for you. A few slides back, you you were showing the correlation between grades uh, for males and females, and that you mentioned that there was a uh, there was a difference between this the sage on the stage and the guide on the site. Is that a, is there a suggestion that say an active classroom or a flipped classroom is is, is more effective for student outcomes? That's the, that's our hypothesis. That we don't have really good data yet to prove that. And also one of the things that we're finding is that in our own institution, as well as others, that it is really hard to tell in the student information system what is quote unquote an active learning classroom versus a more passive learning classroom. So we're trying to tease out or be able to maybe pair up with the syllabus of saying, are there is there evidence of what we call engaged learning activities um, within those classes? And then being able to replicate that and extend that amongst multiple institutions. So that's where we have to start to use some of the qualitative information that instructors have and pair that with the quantitative information, which is more standardized because a lot of institutions have to report to their state and lo and uh, national governments. Yeah. Okay. Very interesting. I'll be very interested to see how you uh, the the results that you get. And there's another question from Bruce. I'm interested in how academics use the data rather than just creating data for data. So actually, how it, how do academics actually use the data? I I guess so. Yep. Bruce is not in the room with us. 
Okay. So um, many instructors are still at the at the early stage of this. So in many cases, it's uh, understanding just if I create if I spend all my time creating a resource, if I create a series of podcasts that are supplementary supplementary materials for my students, or if I create screencasts or le or do a lecture capture. A is anyone even downloading or even viewing those lecture capture? Um, uh, recordings and B which students are making use of them do they have an impact so it's uh, a lot of that uh, is early on I think one of the key insights that I've heard um, from one of the uh, slam talks a couple of years ago actually was a professor in in engineering and she had done one of these things she had created a bunch of uh, screencasts explaining the kind of the, some of her problem sets and she noticed that even though a lot of different students use them that um, because her class was cross disciplinary in engineering, that is always the like I think it was the material science uh, or uh, mechanical engineering students that never seemed to do as well, even though they use the materials the same way. And what she uncovered is she had to go back and actually look at the curriculum and say, oh, this core piece of knowledge that she had assumed that everyone was coming with, that me because mechanical engineering students never actually ex uh, experienced that in their curriculum. So this combination of looking at the analytics and looking at the uh, overarching kind of qualitative information about the curriculum, she was able then to identify. So then she actually went back and revised her materials. She actually said, okay, you mechanical engineering students, you actually need to use these resources even more, or you know, here's some additional resources that are tuned to you so you can actually be on the same plane, planes level and uh, as the rest of the students in the class. Okay, thanks, Steve. Last question from Irina White. Steve, how did the individual innovators who originated applications of LA become involved in the wider adoption community? Right. So, uh, uh, Irina, is that referring to Dave? So, um, I, I think I brushed off this slide. We have this uh, uh, large pool of funds uh, available here in Michigan. We are a, a couple years away in, 20, in 2017, we'll have our uh, bicentennial. So we're merging into what we call the third century of Michigan here. So our president and provost uh, several years ago set aside $50 million of our um, of our endowment and said we are going to invest uh, in teaching and learning for our third century. What does 21st century really look like? And so we were able to use um, some of that funds for this new digital innovation greenhouse as seed funding. And the hope is that um, that as new researchers come in, they will bring additional research funds or additional funding with them. And so we, this, the three people that were really involved in this initially were Tim McKay, myself, and Gus Everard. And these people who have really been at, engaged in learning analytics really since uh, the beginning of the SLAM seminars, and even before that, as you can see some, through some of the history. And uh, so it's growing from that core group. And now through initiatives like MIDAS, as well as some of the other cross-disciplinary initiatives and communities on campus, we're hoping to extend out from that core group. Kind of uh, probably I'm looking at the room or the webcam of the room or there. This is how come the, what we call the likely suspects that you always get coming to kind of the analytics talks. And the effort then is to grow that community beyond that. Okay, thanks very much, Steve. I'd just like to take the opportunity to thank you on behalf of UNISA. We really appreciate you taking the time to speak to us. And hopefully you can come and speak to us again sometime. Sure. Yeah, maybe sure. in actually physically. Maybe soon. Well, we, we, we know for 2.25 million and your $50 million endowment. So uh, that's some incredible levels of funding. Yeah. Maybe get some petty cash and come over. Yeah, that'd be fun. <laughs> All right. Thanks so much for your time, everybody. Hopefully, uh, didn't uh, blow your circuits too much, and uh, hopefully, you had some coffee to.